It is good to be with you this morning. Um, so Blaine mentioned the youth going to do some skating this evening, which is great. Um, when I was probably, I don't know, I was probably around 10 years old, I had a tail that was just legend. It was beautiful, it was flowing, it was, I mean, it was like a lion's um, well, mane. That's what I was looking for. I mean, that's what it looked like, and it was, it was wonderful, right? So I was skating my little heart out at Foxborough Roll Arena till we built the city on rock and roll. I was crushing it. That, that tail was just blowing in the wind. And I ended up wiping out, and a lady came along, and her axle got stuck in my tail. But that thing was so powerful that it didn't break. A strand of three cords is not easily broken. And she went down, they had to cut my tail off, and that may be the most devastating moment of my life. I have not regained my strength since then. I am half the man I once was. True story, though. <laughs> Thankfully, Elijah, my son, does not have a tail. <laughs> All right. When was the last time you thought about we built this city on rock? <laughs> oh, glory days, right there. I can just see it. We're talking about friendship. We're talking about relationships uh, because relationships really are everything. A relationship to God, a relationship to our friends. Our relationship to ourselves, it, it, it all matters, our marriage. And so we've been talking about each of those relationships in the series. Today we get to conclude the series by talking about friendship. So we here at Abundant Life, our theme for the year is on purpose, pressing into what matters most. And that's why we're doing a series on relationships. We want to help you to thrive in your relationships. So and we want you to have great friendships. So we're going to be checking out the passage that Brandon, or actually Zoe read a little bit of. Let me read it to you and then we'll explore how you can have deep, lasting, great friendships. John 15, 9 through 17. As the Father loved me, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, by the way. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So here's the big idea I want you to grab a hold of. Deep friendship occurs when two people choose to love one another the Jesus way. All right. So in our passage, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And this is right before his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion. And so these are his last words to his disciples. And so you can imagine that these words must have been really important words. And what is Jesus tell his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. That's what he's saying to them. Now, that leads us to a question, well, how did Jesus love his disciples? Well, verse 13 tells us Jesus laid down his life for his disciples. That's how he loved them. Now, when you hear that, you, like me, may think, okay, well, Jesus went to a cross for his disciples. That's how he laid down his life for them, right? 
So, does that mean I need to physically die in order to love my friends, right? Perhaps, um, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, um, after this passage, he talks about how the world is going to hate them, just as the world hated him. And so, persecution was going to come. And so, that was a real possibility for his disciples, that they would actually have to lay down their physical life for a brother. Um, but I think for us, I think the chances are really slim. It's highly improbable that Jesus is going to call you to physically die for a friend. Um, he may, you never know, but highly improbable, right? So then does this absolve us of all responsibility then to lay down our life for our brothers? And the answer is no, because if you read in 1 John 3, 16, Jesus makes the same comment that we have to lay down our lives for our brothers. And then notice what it's followed up by. Check this out. 1 John 3, 16 and 17. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So this is what John is telling us, right? And so... This verse is telling us there are real ways to lay down your life for a friend that do not include physical death. One of them that's being used as an example in this passage is sharing your goods with, with a brother in need. And this got me to thinking, all right, if we are to lay down our life uh, for our friends, there's got to be other ways that we do that without physically dying, in addition to sharing our goods with, with needy brothers and sisters. And so I started thinking, all right, how did Jesus lay down his life for his disciples other than his physical life, right? And as I thought about the three years he spent with them, I created this tool that will hopefully be helpful for you. So this is a friendship, the Jesus way. Uh, we see Jesus giving his time. We see Jesus giving support and challenge to his disciples. We see Jesus praying for his disciples. We see Jesus being ultra transparent with his disciples. We see Jesus working for his disciples' growth. And we see Jesus being mentally and emotionally present with his disciples. So this is a tool that I hope will be helpful to you. Let's look at each component of this tool friendship the way that Jesus did it so let's let's start with time friendship the Jesus way requires your time it's it's pretty amazing to think because this sort of thing just doesn't happen in our day but Jesus spent 24 7 with his disciples for three years can you imagine that can you imagine having a group of guys with you just about at all times except when he would get away to pray with you 24 7 that takes sacrifice that's a way to lay down your life you're giving them your time one of your most valuable resources because once time is spent you can't get it back it's a non-renewable resource once it's spent it is gone forever jesus gave his friends a whole bunch of time which means there are probably times when jesus wanted to do other things with his time there are probably times where maybe he even had some to do's he wanted to get done but he sacrificed what he may have wanted to do on any given day to make time for his friends. Um, if you're going to love your friends the way that Jesus loved his friends, um, you're going to have to say to a lot, no to a lot of things so that you can say yes to it. Okay? You're going to have to choose to spend your time differently than maybe you would want to. All right, second thing. Friendship the Jesus way requires you to be mentally and emotionally present. Jim Curzon once quoted, I was an author, a preacher, somebody, um, and the quote has stuck with me. It was this. Jesus' most important ministry was the person right in front of him. It's remarkable. Jesus' most important ministry was the person right in front of him at any given time. When Jesus was with the woman at the well, that she was the most important person right there. That was the most important part of his ministry was that woman at that time. So Jesus was emotionally and mentally present with people. He gave them that gift. 
you know, out of all the time that I would imagine that Jesus would be detached from being mentally and emotionally present with people would be there when he was being crucified. And yet, he was still mentally and emotionally present with the people around him. From the cross, he's telling God the Father, you know, asking God the Father, please forgive them. These people that are killing me, murdering me in the most gruesome way that's ever been invented, Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Emotionally, mentally present, thinking about the needs of the people around him while he's being crucified. And then Mary, his mother, saw Mary from, as he hung on the cross and told John, his disciple, hey, she's going to be like your mom. You're going to take care of her. Remarkable. And then how about the thieves on either side of Jesus, mentally and emotionally present with them, ministering to them as he's hanging on a cross. You see, one of the best gifts we can give a person is our undivided attention when we are mentally and, and, and emotionally present with them, listening well. Um, we need to, and I heard this is so good, we need to be interested before we're interesting or interesting. So many people try and be interesting. First, be interested before you're ever interesting. Listen well. Extend to empathy. Identify with the person you're talking to. Jesus did this exceptionally well. What a gift. And that's a sacrifice, isn't it? Because I don't have this problem, but other people do, I'm sure. <laughs> It's so easy to be with the person and you're like solving the problem you just had at work, you're planning your next day while you're looking them in the face pretending like you're paying attention. There are times, my son, I just heard him say, oh my goodness, because there are times <laughs> when this has actually happened. He has come up to me and they're talking to me. I have no idea they're talking to me. And either Isaiah or Elijah has gone in front of my face like this and be like, Dad, you're on Mars. <laughs> it's horrible. Do they feel loved in that moment? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is what's in my mind is more important than you in front of me, right? Okay, third thing. My lock screen came on. All right, third thing. Friendship the, Je the Jesus way requires transparency. Transparency leads to intimacy. In our passage, this is what Jesus states in verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that are heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus was ultra transparent regarding his inner thoughts and feelings with his disciples. Um, Jesus has had and still has the most intimate relationship that has ever existed with God the Father and, and God the Holy Spirit. And he let his disciples in to, he gave them a window into this most intimate relationship. Jesus let his disciples in. If you are going to be a good friend, you have to let people in. Jesus, when he is at the Last Supper and he tells his disciples that he is troubled in spirit. He lets them in. When his friend Lazarus died in the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He let his disciples see him weep. When he's sweating drops of blood in the garden before his crucifixion, um, he tells Peter, James, and John, his closest friends, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Talk about transparency. If you're going to be a good friend, you've got to let people in. You've got to tell people your fears, your worries, your anxieties, <clears throat> your struggle, your sin issues. Your hopes, your dreams, flaws, shortcomings, you got to let them in because transparency leads to intimacy. All right, number four, friendship the Jesus way requires support and challenge. A few weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast when I was uh, working out and I heard a, a, a snippet on this podcast of a sermon given by John Ortberg. And he described, he gave this, this story. And, and let me explain the scenario to you. 
there's a guy who goes to the doctors and the doctor says to the guy, oh my goodness, you are an absolute physical specimen. Like, wow, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody healthier than you, okay? Then this guy, he goes home and he's walking up the stairs and he has a massive heart attack that almost kills him. As he recovers, he gets to the point where he's able to go back to the doctor. And he says to the doctor, why did you tell me I was extremely healthy when almost all of my arteries were completely blocked? Why didn't you tell me? And the doctor said, well, because I, you know, I didn't want to offend you. I wanted to support you. I wanted you to leave the office happy. And the guy said to the doctor, when it comes to my health, I need to know the truth, right? I don't care if you offend me or not. I need to know. Don't you see this is what we do in our relationships all the time? Pitching in behaviors that are that they're blind to that are hurting themselves and the relationships and yet we are cowards because we do not extend challenge to them and the reason we're cowards is because we're trying to preserve ourselves. we don't want to deal with the discomfort of them maybe being upset we don't want to ruin the relationship in any kind of way because of what it would cost us of losing maybe the 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 the, the certain artificial harmony that we're having in that relationship that we've grown to enjoy jesus loved his disciples enough to bring them challenge i mentioned the last supper what does jesus do here you have the disciples arguing over who is the greatest and Jesus, he challenges them. He says, look, guys, you guys keep arguing about this because this wasn't the first time. You know who's great is the one who serves, not the one who's being served. That's true greatness. And then notice, though, too, with that challenge came this support. What was Jesus doing? He was washing their feet. He was doing an act that was reserved for the lowest non-Jewish slaves. A Jewish person would never have done that. And here Jesus, you see, support and challenge coming together. Grace and truth coming together. Jesus was all grace, all truth, all the time. If you're going to be a great friend, you need to be it too. All right, let's go to the next one. I forgot to turn off my screen lock. That's the problem. Next time, I'll get that right. Friendship, the Jesus way, includes prayer. John 17 records one of Jesus' prayers for his disciples. In the prayer, you have Jesus asking God the Father that his followers, his disciples, they'd be unified, they'd be protected from the attacks of the evil one, that they would be sanctified with God's truth, that they would have inside of them the love that Jesus has always had with the Father and with the Spirit. This is Jesus praying for his disciples. Look, we need to pray for our friends because prayer matters. It makes a difference. One person has said it moves the hand that moves the world. James 4.2 puts it this way. You do not have because you do not ask. Oh, that we would Take our burdens, not just ours, but our friends' burdens to the Lord in prayer. Ask, seek, knock for blessings for your friends because God is a good God. He's a generous God who loves to give good gifts. Ask Him. Right? Another way, that takes sacrifice though, doesn't it? It takes time, it takes energy to pray for your friends. And if we're not well rested, and that can be a challenge for sure. All right, number six. Friendship the Jesus way includes growth. Jesus didn't just hang out socially with his 12 disciples. He was, he was so focused on seeing them become 
who they were created to be in Christ. He wanted to see his disciples reach their full potential. He wanted to see them living in according to his kingdom values, being his representatives to the world. And so Jesus spent time training them, investing in their spiritual growth. So it, I, I just kind of went through the Sermon on the Mount because that is the core of Jesus' teachings to his disciples. Here are the things that Jesus taught them to do. As far as uh, their spiritual growth, he, he taught them to rely completely on God. Jesus taught them to deal with persecution, love their enemies, taught them how to pray, to be salt and light to the world. He taught them, taught them to do good with humility. He taught them how to fast, how to avoid worry, how to avoid worshiping idols, how to seek, the fir seek first the kingdom of God, how to distinguish between true and false prophets, how to heal, how to witness, how to self-reflect, how to forgive, how to handle conflict, how to serve the least of these, how to find true rest, how to combat the enemy, how to be born again, how to understand where sin comes from and its deadliness, how to think about heaven and hell, how to approach marriage, how to be good stewards, how to think about his life, death, and resurrection, how to, va how to value the word of God. These are things that Jesus intentionally trained his disciples on. We love our friends well when we help them grow in the knowledge, in their knowledge of God, in their obedience to him. And again, this takes time and energy. This is how you lay down your life for your friends. All right. So let's look at this graphic again. Hopefully it's there. This is how you love your friends the Jesus way. Now, um, one other thing I'll say, because I forgot to mention it, the support piece, that involves forgiveness too, right? Because as you grow more intimately connected to people, they're going to hurt you. It's just going to happen this side of heaven. And so you got to be quick to forgive. You can't hold grudges, bitterness, and resentment. That will destroy your relationship so quickly. Expect to be hurt and then expect to forgive. And guess what? Expect to hurt people. Hopefully not intentionally, but it's going to happen, right? What matters, uh, more importantly maybe, is how you handle it when it does happen, right? Okay. Here's something that I think is extremely important, this last point, is that Jesus chose to love his friends the way that he did. And this is important. Because it's a choice for us. Nobody's going to force us to love people the way that Jesus did and to have friendships the way that Jesus had them. It's a choice that we're going to have to make. Um, and notice, and we're going to have to choose wisely because here, we only have so much bandwidth. Even Jesus didn't love everybody in some senses the same way. In one sense, in a general sense, yes, he, he loved everybody, but specifically it was different. He, he had a different relationship with the 72 than he had with the 12. He had a different relationship with the 3 than he had with the 12. And so the reality is, there's only going to be a few people in your life in any good, given season that you're really going to be able to love like this. Okay? So you have to choose wisely. Jesus, before he chose the 12 disciples, he spent all night in prayer. He wanted to choose wisely. He knew he had limited time. He had three years to uh, love a group of friends so that when he released them, they would change the world. He chose wisely. Now, did the disciples have a lot going for them? Not really. I mean, they were, if you read, like, they were slow to learn, just like all of us. They continually made mistakes. But here's two things they had going for them. And I encourage you, as you choose wisely, to look for these two traits in a person that you're really going to invest in. Number one, are they teachable? Are they willing to learn? Are they willing to look at their problems and their shortcomings? Are they actually willing to do that? And then, are they hungry to grow? Because until you have people that are teachable and hungry, Jesus let people walk that were not teachable and hungry. And he chose to invest in those that are. We have limited time. We have to choose wisely. Okay. 
So, here's what I want you to do this week. We're gonna email you that tool, so we'll get that to you. And here's a simple step you can take this week, is take that tool, and I want you to prayer, I want you to talk to God about who, who's the one person that God is calling you to love this way. Just one person, let's just start with one. And then, if you're able to identify that person, then the next step is, let's go to each one of these things, and let's write one way we're gonna give them our time. Let's just write it down. What's one way we're gonna offer them support and challenge? Which, what, what, how, how and when are we gonna pray for them, right? How can we be transparent? One way we're gonna be transparent with them. How can we be mentally and emotionally present with them when we are with them, right? So you, you take that person through this tool, you write it down, and then, by the grace that God supplies, you go and execute that plan. And here's the thing. And this is what I love about God's commands. Because they are all for your good. Do you notice what Jesus says in our passage? Love one another. He wants us to love the way that he loved. Why? So that your joy may be full. Amen. It's brilliant. So that my joy may be in you. You see, when we obey Jesus' commands, in the end, we will have not sacrificed at all. Because they're all for our good. They're all for our blessing. And that's how Jesus' kingdom works. you got to lose yourself to find yourself. Maybe the reason you're so miserable... It's because you're not laying down your life for somebody. Might be the reason. Right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us so well. That you truly have laid down your life in so many ways and, pay, and did the ultimate. You, you went to the, 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 the most the most extravagant level to love us by dying for us, to die for the ways that we are a horrible friend to you and to other people. Thank you for paying the penalty for us so that we could be forgiven, so we could receive your spirit that makes us anew, that actually transforms us into people that can lay down our lives for the highest good of another. Lord, may this church, may this, these people in this room be those kind of friends. May we love one another in that sort of way. And as we do, may people look at it and notice it and be like, oh my goodness, God, the God who is driving them, he is amazing, he's wonderful, he is glorious. I went in on that. There's something so different here. So unlike what I see in the world, that's full of discord and vision and unforgiveness. Oh my goodness. Let me in on that community. Let me know that God. Let me know that Savior who loves so well. Let me experience it for myself. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.